Good evening. My name is Ronnie Green and I have the pleasure of serving as the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources here at the University of Nebraska. And welcome to East Campus and to Hardin Hall this evening. We do have an overflow capacity crowd here in the auditorium as you can see. Um, and just so everyone knows, there are overflow rooms both in this building as well as in the Quilt Center directly across the street where there are about this many people um, there as well. So we're, we're very, very gratified to have a wonderful crowd tonight and thank you for being here for this lecture. The Hearman Lectures uh, is an event that we started here at INR last year. This is our second academic year where we have brought world authorities dealing with food security, water security, natural resource security uh, to our campus. These are the key issues that we see ourselves charged with at the Institute and the Hearman Lectures have enabled us to bring people to our campus for our students, for our stakeholders, for our faculty and staff and the greater community to engage in these discussions with us as we think about feeding a growing world the next 40 years ahead of us. Those lectures were enabled by a gift to the University of Nebraska Foundation about two years ago by Keith and Norma Hearman, longtime agriculturalists in the state of Nebraska, uh, involved in both the farming business and the popcorn breeding business. We're very pleased tonight that Keith and Norma and several members of their family are with us. And thank you so very much. Keith and Norma, would you stand and be recognized? <laughs> we also uh, want to refer uh, you to the fact that these lectures are archived. So all of our previous speakers who have come to campus in the Hearman Lectures last year and throughout this year are archived at hearmanlectures.unl.edu, so you can go there and see those, as well as they're taped for distribution on Nebraska Educational Television. And some of you may have seen some of the previous lectures uh, in that venue. We're web streaming these lectures tonight. Uh, so that you'll see cameras um, doing that for us so others can join us in that and for the uh, archiving as well. We are very pleased tonight to welcome to the University of Nebraska Dr. Temple Grandin. Temple is a longtime friend of mine. I'm an animal scientist by trade myself uh, and have had the pleasure of growing up in the beef industry and working around the beef industry throughout my own career and had the pleasure of serving on the faculty at Colorado State earlier in my career with Dr. Grandin and be able to do research work uh, with her. She's truly an amazing person. I know many of you will know much about her story as a high-functioning autistic person who wasn't able to speak at the age of two and yet has used that experience and her own uh, capacity to think about how to improve animal care how to build new animal handling systems uh, that improve the stewardship of our livestock in animal agriculture. It's estimated that half of the cattle in North America are touched directly by livestock handling systems that Dr. Grandin has designed through her Grandin Livestock Systems uh, enterprise that she's been involved with. She went to Colorado State as a faculty member and a partial appointment there in the Department of Animal Sciences in the early 1990s and has been there since. Currently she serves in a 50% faculty appointment in that department as an animal behaviorist and ethologist, studying animal behavior for the good of the animal agriculture industries and the processing industries that support them. She has a long list of awards. I won't uh, say those to you tonight. Uh, you, you have heard about some of them, capped by the capturing of her life just in the last few years as an HBO miniseries that many of you might uh, have seen that won a number of Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe Award. I was kidding her at lunch today whether she watched the Golden Globes whenever that was a couple of nights ago to see that Claire Danes, who portrayed her, won yet another uh, award for uh, her recent work. So Temple is coming to us tonight 
about improving communication in animal welfare. And we're looking forward to her comments and what she has to say to us. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Temple Grandin. That's really, um, really great to be here. Can everybody hear me on this mic okay? Want to make sure you can hear me. And um, I've been working in animal handling ever since the early 70s. And things have really improved in animal handling. In the 70s and the 80s, cattle handling was terrible, absolutely terrible. Electric prods on every single cattle, ramming them against chutes and everything else. That is one of the things that's really gotten a lot better. It's gotten a lot better in terms of equipment, but it's also gotten a lot better in terms of management. One of the things I've learned is people want the thing more than they want the management. Because even back in the 70s, I was uh, selling people, you know, really nice systems. I was putting them in. And I'd get this nice system all started up, and only half my clients would operate it correctly today. Okay, now today, most people are. You know, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has really promoted, you know, beef quality assurance, the importance of low stress handling. That is the real big bright spot in animal welfare. And one of the things that frustrates me is, we've improved a lot of these things and nobody knows about it. And this gets into communicating with the public. Because when I went out to Hollywood, and I talked to the Hollywood press, they were just curious. They asked questions like, what's a feedlot? <laughs> I'm not kidding. They didn't know what a feedlot was. They had absolutely no idea what a feedlot was. Well, I've got a video up on the internet now. It's a beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. It shows how a beef plant works. And it shows how it all works. We need to start showing things. All right, let's just start talking a little bit about animal handling, because that's my subject. And this is the bright spot in animal welfare. And I wish more people knew about the good things that are going on in animal handling. Because you get on YouTube, and there's videos in there, gate rods being used on pigs to beat them up, uh, cattle getting poked at with pitchforks and things like that. And there's some activist groups that imply that that's how most people handle their cattle or their pigs. That's simply not true. Because that would be like saying, well, everybody you know, drives drunk. You go out and you get a bunch of terrible pictures of drunken driving, and then say, well, that's how everybody drives. Well, that's simply not true. Because what I've seen in a 40-year career in animal handling is when I first started, maybe 10 or 20% of the people did a decent job of handling cattle. Now it's probably 80%. That's expanded. And there's still a bottom 10% that's bad. There's some people that probably shouldn't be handling livestock. All right, let's talk about some basic principles about animal handling, because that's the thing I really like to talk about. Calm cattle, calm pigs, they're easier to handle. When animals get all fearful, and yes, fear is a proper scientific word, uh, it, they get harder to handle. They stick together like glue, and it takes half an hour for them to calm back down. So don't get the animals all upset in the first place. Calm down. No yelling and screaming. You know, this is an area where people are getting a whole lot better. I go into the meat plants now, it's quiet like church. They used to be yelling and screaming and arm waving, whistling. That's gotten stopped. Now how can you tell that animals are calm when you're handling them? Well, they're going to have nice, soft brown eyes. And when the animal gets upset, the eyes start bugging out, and you see the whites of their eyes. And there's actual scientific research that shows when the whites of the eyes are showing, the animal's getting scared. So how did scientists prove that that had to do with fear? Because if you give them Valium, then they don't get scared. And I realize that's totally illegal. You can't give cattle Valium. <laughs> but what they did is it proved the concept that when you see the whites of their eyes, you see the tail switching, things like that, you've got an animal that's getting upset. And in training people working with animals, they need to be learning some of the animal's postures. Tail swishing in cattle is not a good thing. That's your warning that they're getting ready to kick you or some other bad thing. Heads up, ears pinned back. And I do a lot of talks with animal science students, a lot of talks with veterinary students, and I talk about, um, uh, you know, you need to read the postures of the animal. Now, here's a little chain hanging down in a chute. I've been talking about the need to get rid of things like this for 40 years. Why do I have to still keep talking about this kind of stuff? Because people don't take them out. And you might wonder, what did autism have to do with helping me in animal handling? 
I'm an extreme visual thinker. And when I was in my 20s and 30s, I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I think. Oh, and incidentally, my book, Thinking in Pictures, is for sale afterwards. I'll be happy to sign it for you. <laughs> Real happy to do that. And I thought everybody thought the way I thought. No, that's not true. Most people, you know, visual thinking is kind of a continuum. But animals notice visual details. They notice details we tend to not notice. And you could have a chain hanging down in the chute, and they're not going to go up that chute. OK, here you've got changes in the flooring. Here the pigs are going from a concrete floor to a plastic floor. Give the lead animal a chance to stop and take a look. And once the lead animal crosses, then the other animals will cross. Or you've got a drain across there. Now, if you have a dairy situation, well, the old cows, they'll walk right over the drain. But the new heifer, she's going to stop. Give her her chance to stop and look at it. And it's really important that an animal's first experience with something new, like the horse trailer, going through the corrals and the squeeze chute, is a good first experience. You know, there's been quite a few people now uh, advocate uh, walking your heifers through the corrals. You know, sometimes you've got to do some things that hurt, but let's not have it be the first experience. Make those first experiences of those corrals positive. Here's a reflection. They're very sensitive to reflections. And you can get time of day effects. Animals tend to go from a dark place to a light place, but they're not going to go into blinding, blinding light, like looking into the sun. So if you're trying to load the truck, and the sun's coming up over the top of the truck, well, they're not going to go in. Maybe wait for another two hours. If you're in an indoor facility, such as a meat plant or a slaughter plant, I won't call them harvest facilities. I think that's silly. When I went out to Hollywood, it was slaughter plant. You know, and if I want to sanitize it, I'll call it meat plant, but I'm not going to call it a harvest facility. That's for grain. Yeah, you take that down to the grain elevator, you know. <laughs> That's not something you do with beef. Okay, so I'm in an indoor facility, and I got a reflection on the floor, and the animals refuse to go up the chute, and I move some lights, and then they'll go right up the chute, or add some lights. It's amazing what you can do with lights. It's amazing how you control what they see. You put a solid side up in just the right place, so they don't see the trucks going by, then they're going to move. So the first work I ever did with livestock is I got down in the chutes to see what the cattle were seeing. People thought that was crazy back in the early 70s. Well, you see there on a sunny day, I got shadows. Cloudy day, I won't have the shadows. They can see people. I've either got to put up a solid side or I've got to get the people away from it. And the most important part to cover is the outer perimeter. That's the most important part to cover. And I have a book called Humane Livestock Handling. Unfortunately, the books that didn't get shipped in, but they got a display copy out there. And that's got all my cattle handling stuff in it, cattle corral things. It's a book aimed at ranchers. And they'll be more than happy to take orders for it. OK, I just want to show you some other examples of things that can spook animals. Look at how those animals are avoiding walking on the sunbeam. I want to get you aware of that sort of thing. Here at the pig farm, you've got shadows there. Look at how, you, how the struts in the window are making, you know, like stripes on the floor. And the sun was going in and out. So when the sun is behind a cloud, you don't have a shadow. So the pigs are going through there nicely sometimes, other times they don't. This is what I call the black hole. You've got really, really sunny outside, and you've got a black hole inside this cattle handling building. And they don't want to go in. Now this is going to work just fine at night, I can light it up with lights, and they'll go in great at night. Yeah, cloudy day, they'll go in pretty good. But on a real sunny day, it'd be horrible to get them in. So what I got to do is I got to open up the walls. I got to get daylight into this building. Because yeah, I can put some lights in there, but the problem is the sun's 100 times brighter than any reasonable light I can buy. So I got to get tin off. That's what I got to do. I got to get it so that as the animals come in, they can see through the building. And then replace some of that tin with white translucent skylights. And I like translucent because I don't want to have the shadows. I want to get in lots of daylight without shadows. And when you're building new facilities, put white translucent panels in the ceiling. Now you'll notice right there on this particular facility, you got a solid crowd gate. That's really important. Crowd gate needs to be solid so they don't shove it back in your face. Now, I always get asked, are the cattle scared of getting slaughtered? I always get asked that. 
And this is something I had to answer very early in my career. So I went over to the local Swift plant in Arizona, and in the movie they renamed it Abbott, because, you know, still Swift name still exists, and trying to get permission, that takes an act of Congress, so, uh, you know, we just make a fake name up, and then the places that no longer existed, like Scottsdale Feed Yard, you know, bad old Scottsdale Feed, Feed Yard, you could use the real name. That was uh, torn down 25 years ago. And so I go over to Swift over in Tolleson, and I found the cattle behaved the same way at the Swift plant as they behaved at the feed yard going up the veterinary chute and the chute for implanting and all that kind of stuff. Well, if they knew they were going to get slaughtered, they'd be much, much wilder at the plant, but that wasn't the case. Actually, they usually behaved better at the plant. Interesting enough, the handling in the plants in the 70s, a lot of them was quite good. It was in the 80s and the early 90s that things got messy. But the thing is, the slaughter plants have really gotten good today, really good. But if you look at some of the stuff on the internet, you'd think they were, they were terrible. Well, you know, you know, things have improved and people don't know about it. And I find that incredibly frustrating. All right, now looking at this picture, what are some things in this picture, looking at it from a cattle handling standpoint, that are good or bad? One thing that's good is as the animals look into this tunnel, we've got the white translucent panels. And then I'll ask my students to critique this slide, and they'll say, well, the chain's hanging out. But I find about half the students fail to see the three guys standing where they should not be standing. You've got three people standing where they should not be standing. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. And we need visual thinkers in the world. And we need visual thinkers on the design team. And when I found out why the Fukushima nuclear power plant blew up, I couldn't believe it. They made a mistake no visual thinker would make. They put the emergency generators for the emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. So what do you think happened to those diesels when they went underwater? They like, they don't work. <laughs> now this shows some of my curved facilities. Cattle have a natural behavior to want to go back to where they come from. Well, you want to use that principle in handling facilities. You want to lay out tubs so they go around like a full half circle. You know, laying things out right is important. I got lots of stuff on my website at grandon.com. It's just grandon.com, my last name. Lots and lots of uh, corral designs and things there. And this shows a round crowd pen made in a full half circle. So as you come on around the bend, they're going back to where they come from. And one of the most critical parts of the design is right where the single file joins the crowd pen. They, when they're standing there at that junction, he's got to be able to see up their two body lengths. If you bend it too sharply, it's not going to work. You've got to lay things out right. Detail of design is really, really important. And the most important part to make solid is your outer perimeter. So they don't see distractions, like vehicles going by. People working with animals need to understand the flight zone. And flight zone's the animal's personal space. Now, if you have a show animal, that has no flight zone at all. You have an animal that's out in a mountain ranch in Colorado, well, that can have a real big flight zone. So there's like three things that determine the flight zone. Amount of contact with people, quality of the contact, rough versus quiet, and genetic factors. The more flighty animals tend to have a bigger flight zone. People need to understand how the flight zone works. And when you invade the flight zone in a confined area, you can get animals turning back on you. Now here's the handy dandy way to get an animal into the squeeze chute without having to use the electric prod. So what do I, how do I feel about electric prodders? Get them out of your hand. You know what most of the big plants are doing now? They got one battery operated electric prodder at the entrance to the restrainer system. All the other electric prodders, I got rid of them. So my view on electric prods is if you have an animal that won't go in the squeeze chute, you pick it up, you use it once, and then put it away. But get it out of your hand. Now what you do here is you walk back past the point of balance. Okay, here at the shoulder of the animal. A point of balance. And when you're behind the point of balance, they go forward. When you're right up close to them in a chute, the point of balance is right at the shoulder. So if I, let's imagine this is a squeeze chute, and I got the cattle lined up here, and I kind of just walk back by them, kind of fast like that. And if it's across the shoulder, they'll go forward. Seems counterintuitive, but it works. That's using behavior. I want to get people into the mindset of using behavior rather than force. And I also have a big Spanish section on uh, grandon.com. Right there, I'm demonstrating turning an animal with a little flag. 
People get way too aggressive with driving aids. Don't get in there waving this all around, hitting animals and stuff with it. When they're calm, I can just put them down there and I can just turn the animal with it, nice and gently. Now right here, going through the round crowd pen, notice it's filled only half full. Good handling is going to require more walking. Taking smaller groups, you've got to have to walk more. Same thing's true for pigs. Four to six market hogs at a time to load onto the truck. Small groups. Notice the crowd gate's not squished up really tight. Another principle is use following behavior. Wait until the single file's got some room in it. And then I can just bring the cattle in, keep them going. They're going back to where they come from, and they walk right up the chute. You want to use those behavioral principles. Things like following behavior and the point of balance. Watch what I, your ears. What are the ears doing on horses and cattle? Look at how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other and the other ears on me. They look at things with their ears. Want to get you observing these things. When the animals are completely scared, you're not going to see these things. But when they're calmer, you will see this. And they'll put the ear right on the handler. Watch the handler. Here are some behavioral principles of restraint. I cannot emphasize the importance of non-slip flooring. In the things I've done in a lot of handling facilities, I'm amazed at the problems you can fix with a non-slip floor. And these woven rubber tire mats, they're absolutely wonderful for putting down in front of the squeeze chute. And then you want to make sure your animal's not doing this kind of jig slipping. Then the squeeze chute is just going like that and just getting more and more and more and more crazy. You know, you want to stop that foot from slipping like that. Sudden jerky motion scares, you know, make sure you don't, you don't, you don't need to squeeze them to death with a squeeze chute, you know. You just got to hold them. And when they're calm, they're so much easier to hold. The whole principle is I want a calm animal walking into that chute at the slaughter plant, walking into the squeeze chute. Now, I did one of the very first studies to show that animals that become agitated in squeeze chutes have lower gains. And when my student, Bridget Wozenay, first did this study, we were, I was looked at like I was a nutcase. Well, there's only about 250 other papers now on this. Behavior does matter. Animals that jump around in squeeze chutes have lower weight gains. Animals that race out of squeeze chutes have lower weight gains and are more likely to have meat quality problems. But on the other hand, I don't want to just select beef cattle to where they become Holsteins. Because Holstein doesn't exactly care much about her calf. And I have another student, Connie Flerker. And what Connie Flerker did is she looked at different ways mama cows defend their calf. So he mildly threatened the cow with a strange vehicle circling around at this. Some cows are really vigilant, put their head up. Some cows would call their calf, and there are a few bad cows that walk off and just leave their calf. <laughs> That's not something you want a beef cow to do. Okay, this kind of shows different levels of stress during handling. Now up there at the top, Really rough, bad cattle handling, lots of electric prods, and you really got the cortisol levels up high. Dairy cows is lower because the dairy cow voluntarily goes. When you force animals to do things, you get a lot more fear stress. And all your stress hormones, that's going to go up and up and up. And then down there, I got trained antelope. I worked with Nancy Earl back at the Denver Zoo, and we trained the untrainable animal. The animal's supposed to be untrainable. And we train them to stand still to get their shots and their veterinary examinations and their blood tests. And we got just about baseline levels of cortisol out of them. We want to get animals voluntarily cooperating with us, not be forcing them through things. And when we do that, we're going to drastically reduce the amount of stress. Now, there are some diurnal variations in, in cortisol levels. But if you've got um, you know, 60 nanograms per milliliter of cortisol after handling or something's really bad, then you do need to remember it's a time-dependent measure. It takes 15 or 20 minutes to peak out. And then we got deer there that were netted. And I've had wildlife biologists say to me, well, we held them down for only 30 seconds. It can't be that bad. And I say, well, let's say we went out the, in this big city and somebody uh, mugged you and stole your wallet. Maybe that took 15 seconds, but you know what? You'd be real stressed over that. <laughs> First experiences with new people, places, or equipment, they need to be good. And we want to get animals acclimated to procedures. Animals that are acclimated to transport get a lot less stressed than animals that are not acclimated to transport. Well, the thing about something new is something new is attractive 
if the animals can voluntarily approach it. And it's scary if you just jam it in their face. There was a very interesting experiment done with horses. And they trained a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella suddenly opening. Normally, that would really startle an animal. If I went in the middle of the feed yard with those umbrellas, it would just go, Phew. well, I know a bunch of cattle scattering doing that. I don't recommend doing that. But the thing is, training it to tolerate a blue and white umbrella did not transfer to another novel object like an orange tarp because they're visual. Now, the thing that was interesting here is when the, the paper was still, the cattle came up to the clipboard. When the paper waved, the cattle jumped back. And I do have a paper assessment stress during handling and transport. And when I first did this, I go, it's like a switch. They either seek or they run away. Well, guess what? Five years ago, the switch was developed. It was discovered, not developed. It was discovered in the brains of rodents in the, in there, in the part of the brain called nucleus accumbens. There's a biochemical switch. And they can either go in seek mode approach or fear mode. And the animal can either be more biased towards fear or more biased towards seek, depending upon genetics and whether or not it's been abused when it was young. Well, there's a, you know, these horses have really calm genetics. They don't really get too worried about the umbrella. Now, a common problem that I'm seeing with feedlot cattle is animals differentiate. A man on the horse is not the same thing as a man on the ground. And I've seen cattle that will have a very small flight zone to the man on the horse, maybe five feet. But when they see that first man on foot, they got a flight zone of, you know, the distance as big as this room. Well, that's kind of dangerous at an auction or a packing plant. It's really important to get cattle habituated to going in and out of pens both on a horse and on foot so that when you send them on down the road, uh, they're not freaking out and hitting fences when somebody tries to handle them on foot, which can be rather dangerous, not good. Now, I've been doing a lot of work on animal welfare auditing. And I used to get very frustrated because I go into a plant or feed yard or ranch and I put in a really nice facility. And I come back a year later, and over half my clients had the hot shots out and screaming and everything else. And what had happened is they had slowly lapsed back into bad handling, and they didn't realize it. That's why we need to be measuring handling. It prevents bad from becoming normal. Can you imagine how much speeding they'd be on the highway if the police never measured it? <laughs> and you need to have clear guidelines. You don't have guidelines to say, do the right, correct speed. Yeah, you, there's an actual numerical score there, for what speed you ought to be going. You need to have clear guidelines. And in writing guidelines, I'm involved in writing a lot of guidelines. I was on the OIE slaughter committee. And one of the things I wrote in that is we've got to have some clear guidelines on stuff you don't do, like throwing animals, jumping animals off of trucks without a loading ramp. Now, I'm not talking about stock trailer. I'm talking about something this high. Um, like killing animals by stabbing them in the back of the neck with the punctilla. You know, cutting tendons, because this is for the world. I mean, nobody cuts tendons here or pokes out eyes. Nobody does that here. But there's some places in the world where that's done. And you've got to come out and say, well, it's just bad stuff that you just absolutely shouldn't do. But the trend now in auditing animal welfare and many other things, and the OIE's got a lot of animal welfare guidelines, so the World Animal Health Organization, ISO's going to be coming out with guidelines is using what's called an outcome-based measure. And I'm going to show you some for handling. But other outcome-based measures I might use for dairy would be body condition score, lameness. Those would be outcome-based measures. OK, what about for beef cattle? Handling is the bright spot. But I am concerned as we're getting heavier cattle, more use of beta agonists, more black cattle, we've got to be very, very careful about heat stress. And one simple thing that you can measure is, are they breathing with their mouth open? Terry Mater, who used to be here, did a lot of research on that. Uh, if you're not careful with beta agonists, you can get, to get them to so they look like Arnold Schwarzenegger's arm, make their butt look like two of a bodybuilder's uh, you know, biceps. You can get stiff cattle, lame cattle. That's not OK. So basically, I watch a lot of cattle get off the trucks at the meat plants, and they better, know, they better be walking normally. I've seen pigs where uh, they, they've got very bad leg conformation. Makes them lame. Lameness is a really good outcome measure. There's a lot of different things that can make animals lame. That needs to be kept at a very, very low level. 
The organic people, they need to be measuring coat condition. Because we shouldn't be getting bad becoming normal that it's okay for cattle to have lice and have bald spots. That is absolutely not okay. Here's an example of a guideline that's clear. All the animals have to have enough room to lie down without being on top of each other. You write something like give them sufficient space, I don't know what that means. But I can, and I've done a lot of work on training auditors for the animal welfare audits for the meat plants. You got a day and a half workshop and things have got to be simple. Okay, let's look at scoring animal handling. These are examples of outcome measures. And I'm not telling you how to build facilities here. I'm telling you, you need to achieve certain outcomes. Yes, I designed facilities. I'd be happy to do that. But one thing we learned in the work that I did with McDonald's back in 1999 the, on, the, on starting the McDonald's audits, is some of our older plants that had some pretty old uh, facilities. We were able to get most of those to work with simple changes, non slip flooring, solid sides in the right places, fixing lighting, and training people. All right, let's look at animal handling outcome variables for beef cattle. How many animals run when you open up the squeeze chute? That's not a good thing. How many animals fall? That needs to be very, very low, like you know, under 1%. How many animals moo when you catch them in the head gate because you hurt them with the head gate? That's stuff I can measure. And how many animals did you move with the electric prod? It should be a very, very low level. And the advantage of measuring this is I can tell, am I getting better? or am I getting worse? Now this is the American Meat Institute criteria for animal handling. And this has been used now for over 10 years. Uh, it's being used around the world. Now the thing is, these are five very simple outcome variables. How many animals did we stun correctly on the first shot? Boy, I can tell you, when we started back in 1999, it was bad. Lots of plants broken uh, stunning equipment. And the thing is, that's an outcome measure. How many animals did I get dead before we uh, hang them up and cut things off of them? That better be all of them. How many animals did you poke with the electric prodder? If you want an excellent score, let's get it down to 5%. Acceptable, you can do 25% in the plant. How many animals moo? Most of our plants right now, getting the cattle up in the restrainer, got a 2% vocalization score. I can tell you this is one place where we're ahead of Europe. There's a paper in Meat Science in a French plant, they got a 25% vocalization score. That's something to be ashamed of. That's not something to be proud of. Falling score, it should be 1% or less. Actually, if you aggregate the data in the plants, it's like 1 in 2,000. You know, I just read a brand new paper in the Journal of Animal Science on a, on a good lo hog loading ramp versus a bad one, and the good loading ramp had an 11% falling score. Well, that should have been in the methods that they were using an electric prod on every single pig. Yes, the good loading ramp was better than the bad one, but an 11% falling score? Be ashamed. Slaughterhouses are doing a whole lot better than that. What people don't know about it. That drives me crazy. Now, the thing that's good about using objective scoring is whether I audit a plant or McDonald's audit a plant or Wendy's audit the plant, we're getting the same scores. That's good. In 1996, when I first started this, only 30% of the plants could shoot 95% on the first shot because their equipment was busted. Now it's way, it's way better. It's gotten a whole lot better. And a lot of the plants now have put in video auditing where auditors over the internet can look at them at any time and see how things are going. Yeah, because well, this solves the problem of when the back is turned. Yeah, because unfortunately, the latest mess we had out there at Central Valley Meats, they had been audited two weeks prior and they passed the audit because the plant made sure that all the awful cattle weren't brought in. And I get very upset that beef is taking the rap for a lot of dairy sins. Because I travel around and people say to me, who oh, won't eat beef again? They don't realize those were Holstein dairy cows out in California. And about half of the problem that you had at that plant was caused by factors on the farm. You got cows that shouldn't be there. So lame they can't walk, so skinny they can barely move. What I'm seeing now in the slaughter plants, and I see a problem, it's something from the farm. Like, you know, bad leg conformation. Cattle that are wild because they haven't been handled on foot at all. Uh, cattle that are stiff, things like this. No, that stuff's got to be fixed at the farm. Now the principle of this is you measure a small number of critical control points. Let's go back to our traffic. When you really get right down to it, there's only three things a police really need to measure. Speeding, 
red light stop sign violations, and erratic driving. That's going to cover all the drunken driving stuff. That's probably about 90% of all your stuff. Those are critical control points. And it's using the same principle as a HACCP food safety audit. The other thing is, it's, it's not a paperwork audit. I've seen more paperwork stuff. Everybody wants to turn food safety and animal welfare and everything else into 10,000 tons of paperwork. Well, I worked for 20 years in the construction industry, and I saw more fake paperwork, more fake truckers' logbooks. I want to look at directly observable things, like how many cattle fall down, or how many skinny ones you've got, or lame ones you've got, or how much open mouth breathing you've got, some other thing I can directly observe. Now, this can show you how you can improve your handling. If I got air blowing out the entrance of the restrainer, the, the animals are not going to go in. And I get rid of that, and then I got less vocalization because I'm not prodding them all the time. I can chart an improvement. Here's a dark entrance. I put a light on the entrance of a chute, and I went from 38% of these pigs having to be electric prodded down to only 4%. All I did was duct tape a light to the entrance of the chute. That was a nice, simple, easy fix. Now, this is my center track restrainer system. And if you go to the beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin, you can see this in a real plant operating. And you'll notice that the cattle walk down a little entrance ramp. And that little entrance ramp is cleated. And if you saw the movie, um, there was a scene in there where they put a metal plate over my cleated ramp, and the cattle flipped over and drowned. That actually happened. People had a hard time getting their head around that a non-slip ramp going in, the cattle actually walk in. You also have to have a fault floor under this, because this is seven or eight feet above the ground. And if they look down and go, ah, a cliff, they're not going to go in there. See, again, this gets down to using behavior. You'll also see that there's kind of a hold down rack here. You've got to make sure this is long enough so when the head pops out here, the feet are off the entrance ramp. A two-foot difference in this is the difference between cattle riding calmly and cattle going berserk in the system. Yes, behavior actually really does matter. And sometimes I can't believe how well it works. You also got to make sure that this hold down doesn't hit them right here, they won't go in. It's a lot of little details. I think I'm going to get job security because I still go into places and I, I can fix all these little things. And sometimes you've got to fix a whole lot of little things. I went into one plant, uh, and uh, the little backstop gate was shaking like this, and the cattle wouldn't go by, wouldn't go in the chute because the gate was shaking. And when I told the plant manager, he goes, why didn't I see that? See, that's looking at visual detail. Okay, this is what's called the visual cliff. Both animals and babies were not going to go out over a piece of glass where they see the drop off. It's a visual cliff effect. You've got to make sure you've got that um, uh, false floor in there so they don't see the visual cliff effect. Okay, here are some other things I fixed. I installed a light on the restrainer entrance, and I went from 8% mooing and vocalizing down to 0% one light. I put in a false floor. I went from 9% down to 0%. Why are people taking stuff off of this? I go in and they've taken the ramp off. They've taken the false floor out because they don't want to clean the extra metal. Well, they wouldn't be taking the drive unit off. Oh, 2012, I had two people um, cut the ramp off the restrainer entrance, so we had to go put it back on. And these people weren't doing this to be bad. It's like they didn't see it. Now, reduced pressure on the neck, I went from 23% down to 0%. And there's just an example of a light on the entrance of the chute. And this is um, some pigs that were easy to drive versus pigs that were hard to drive. But one other thing I want to do now, I think the thing I want to do right now, is I'm going to just open it up for questions, because I love to have lots of discussion. And I will repeat the questions so that people can hear the questions. I don't know if we have a battery-operated mic or not to go around. I'll take a few questions off the front, and I will repeat them. And the other thing, oh, I got a few other things to talk about. Let's talk about a few other things on, on uh, communicating with, you know, the people in Chicago and New York and things like that. The thing is, is what's chores to you is interesting to people in the cities. <laughs> I'm not kidding. 
And one of the great uh, PR things was this, I'm farming and I grow it, to I'm sexy and I know it. <laughs> Boy, that put a lot of professional PR firms to shame. Make your own YouTube videos. Send pictures of calving and stuff and just chores you know, to, to your friends in Chicago. Uh, let's look at how something like the old pink slime mess. That was not handled well. Which, well, one of the reasons I didn't jump into that debacle is, I'll be perfectly honest, I didn't know what the stuff was. See, our two plants in Chicago, I mean in Colorado, not in Chicago, our two plants in Colorado don't make finely textured beef. And in most of the other plants I get into, I stay in the live side and the slaughter side. And that wasn't handled well. That plant, there should have been a video of that whole entire plant up on the internet. They had a thousand perfect food safety tests. Why wasn't that put up right away? You know, that's not, being, that's not being handled very well. And then I started calculating how many cattle we'd waste if we don't use that product. Well, you know, people don't, don't respond very well to big abstract numbers about things. So I changed it to how many semi-loads of cattle we'd be throwing away. I said, let's say in your four biggest plants you got here, we diverted a truck load each day to the dump and shot them. That's what would happen basically by not using finely textured beef. Be throwing away a lot of meat. But the problem is, it was a surprise. It was not on the label. People don't like surprises. No, we need to be explaining stuff. You know, we have got to do that. We absolutely have got to do those kind of things. We've got to change some activities and then show what we do. Slaughter plant video has been getting pretty good reviews. We've got to be showing stuff. And um, I've, been, I've taken people on, uh, on uh, tours of slaughter plants for years, and they're kind of amazed at how quietly cattle walk up the chute. No, it's um, people who don't know where anything's made. We've got a generation growing up today that doesn't do stuff anymore because they've taken all the hands-on classes out of the schools. We've got problems with critical thinking skills, too. And I think a lot of the hands-on things, I was over there at the... Um, at the meeting, and they, uh, they were the quilt place. Got to see this cool little sewing machine, like I had when I was a little kid. Now that's making stuff. You got to solve problems. Okay. What I think I want to do right now is we are going to have some questions. Okay. How about the guy here with the red shirt? Maybe you can ask something. I think there are okay. there are roving mics. Okay. We've been challenged by Dr. Grandin to ask questions. So there's mic down on the floor here. There also is a mic up on the upper deck. So if you have a question, pop your hand up and the, the uh, mic will come to you. We need you to say it on the mic, number one, so it can be heard and it can be streamed. Who's uh, Fred Bruning in the back? Yes, I can hear you. Well, when a Hollywood, the word slaughter was just fine. I use that word in Hollywood. Uh, if you want to clean it up a bit, how about processing plant or meat plant? You know what they call it in Australia? They call it the meat works. I think that, no, I'm sorry, I think that's a pretty good word. On my video that I sell, I call it the meat plant. We could call it a processing plant. But I think harvest is just sort of um, sanitizing things a bit too much. Now, when I talked to the Hollywood press, it was all slaughter. And you know what happened during the Hollywood press conference? They, all they wanted to ask was cattle questions. And the moderator had to cut it off because the director was there and they wanted to get some movie questions. <laughs> and the Hollywood press, they wanted to find out how the slaughter plants worked. And they were just curious. They were just absolutely curious. And when we think everybody in Hollywood's a bunch of drunks, you know what they were doing at that Golden Globes party? Networking for the next job. And we're not getting drunk, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Who has the next question? Well, I'm in kind of a situation where I kind of go back and forth, because with the autism stuff and a lot of my autism books, I'm going back and forth between the city world and the ag world. And uh, that's, that's a real interesting perspective. I think we have a question okay. right up on the upper deck. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so when you're branding cattle, will it be like a way to reduce um, them from like screaming and 
like moving around so much, like in the shoot? What, do we have your branding cattle? Yeah. Well, uh, have a good squeeze shoot to hold them. Uh, and I'm a big definite believer in having a complete squeeze shoot where both sides squeeze in. Okay, if he's doing standing, I, I like where both sides squeeze in so your animal's not pushed off balance. Because on, on a, you, there's some squeeze shoots that squeeze on one side. Now if you adjust them right, they're all right. But if they're adjusted wrong, then you throw your animal off balance. And then it freaks out and panics because you're throwing it off balance. And uh, I mean, if you're gonna brand cattle, you better have more than just a head gate on the end of an alley. Uh, uh, but I'm a big fan of having a complete squeeze shoot. It's a lot safer for you and the cattle. Okay. Next question. There's a couple more up on the upper deck. Pop your hand up so the mic folks can, can see you. Dr. Grand, and we happened to see a lecture by Dr. Carriker of ISU last spring, and he was talking to our veterinary class about this wonderful chute they had designed for pigs to go up. It was a ramp. Designed for pigs. Designed for pigs. Okay. And he talked to us about how, by changing the degrees of how steep it was, the pigs would go up it. And it sounded like a wonderful shoot, but by the end of the presentation, he told us it cost anywhere from 20000 to 30000 First of all, you don't need to have a, a shoot that expensive. I know just what shoot you're talking about, way too expensive. And I read the paper in the Journal of Animal Science. It's also the paper where the, the, when they tested that, they were hot shotting all the pigs, too. Because I called up the author and I said, what were you doing to these pigs to get an 11% falling score? Yeah. And it wasn't in the methods that they hot shotted every pig. And the main things on that shoot that were improved isn't going to cost $20,000. Yeah. I was just down at uh, Seaboard Farms okay. and they've got a portable chute and they've made it longer. So instead of having a 20 foot angle, you've got the 15 degree angle. I think that's important. That doesn't cost $20,000. And you make your chute just a little bit wider so two big markets, and pigs have gotten a lot heavier, can walk up side by side, space the clates about six or eight inches apart. That's going to work fine. They got a lovely, nice, simple, portable chute that's wider and longer. It works just fine, and it doesn't cost twenty dollars or $30,000. Because you've got to look at that thing and go, what are the features on that that made it work so much better? And I read that paper really carefully. You reduce the angle. Now, if you make it 10 degree, then, then the trailer so long it like, gets stupid. Uh, and they, these pigs went up really nice up this chute. And you want to make it so two pigs can walk up there side by side and not jam. And then have really good non-slip footing. And they just had bars welded to the floor. It worked great. So I guess my question is then, how are you going to sort between hyped up science like that and versus sort common what? sense? How are you going to sort between like hyped up stuff like that and just common hyped sense up. then? Between hype. For the industry. Like that. Hyped up what now? Like I that chute she was talking about. Well, I, I wouldn't, um, I don't think you need to buy something that expensive. Yeah. I saw something a whole lot cheaper that I thought worked absolutely great. You know, one of the things you gotta do is look at what are the features that made it better. And increased width and less angle are the two features that made it better. And the other thing that's really important is not to get the pigs so excited. Calm handling, four to six at a time, and they were doing that. But when I called up the author, he admitted they put a hot shot in the middle of every single pig. Because when I looked at the scores there, those scores were terrible, even with a good shoot. 11% falling score, you should be ashamed. I watched pigs getting loaded out on this other cheaper shoot. Uh, we, we did a half a truck while I was there, where they didn't have any fall. Because we were filming a pig handling video, and, and, and uh, you, can, you can achieve the same result with something that's not so expensive. But the other thing is don't get animals so excited. Because even with the old ramp that's 20 degrees, I have seen them handled where they're not falling. And it will work fairly decently. You've got to have a good non-slip floor in it. I think there's another question right up here on the deck. Um, okay. Yeah, you've mentioned um, recently in a number of um, um, swine magazines or livestock magazines that the uh, gestation crate has to go in the swine industry. With that said, what do you feel? What is the appropriate way to house gestating sows well, without the gestation? One of the crate? problems with the sow stall thing, and I'm fully aware of all the scientific research, 
is uh, you're not going to sell it to the public. And if you'd like to stand up at Barnes & Noble in New York and try to sell it, um, I'll set it up for you. You might die. So um, uh, let's look at things that can work. There are three basic different ways you can house sales in groups, and they all work. You can do European uh, you know, free choice lockup stalls. They cost a lot of money. You can take the existing sow stalls and cut the backs off and have five pigs in a little group. Or you can use the electronic feeders. But if you want to go with the electronic feeders, you better like computers very much. So it's kind of personal preference as to which one of those systems you use. They are going to take more space, anywhere from 10 to 30% more space. OK, how do we deal with fighting? The first thing is genetics. I had a chance to go down and visit Smithfield, and uh, they had to change some of the sow genetics. See, the problem is, in the late 80s, and I watched this happen, when the industry went into the lean line pigs, they accidentally bred a mean pig that fights a lot. Nobody did that del deliberately. It was kind of a mistake that happened. And you've got to get genetics that's not so mean. And other things you can do, I just read a brand new paper in the Journal of Animal Science uh, on uh, don't mix different parodies. You know, don't take a first parody gilt and put it in with an old big huge mamas that are on the fourth paddock. The parody. You know, don't mix the parodies. You know, there, there are some things that you can do, you know, to make it work, but you are going to have to change uh, genetics. The thing I think is very interesting on this, why is Smithfield changing it first? I think you need to look at a map of the United States and look at where corporate offices are located. And Smithfield's got corporate offices located right next to population centers. Guess what? There's going to be social mixing outside the box. And I think that has something to do with it. Yes, question right down here on the floor, Mary. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, when you were working on the movie and you spent time in Hollywood, I imagine you ran into a lot of people Well, when I, I talk to people and I tell them things like, I mean, sit next to somebody on a plane or something like that, and I tell them about the McDonald's audits, they'll go things like, McDonald's does that? You've got to be kidding. You know, the, you see, this is where the good things that have happened are, isn't getting out there. And we need to get the good things out. Because let me tell you where the good things are. Handling and slaughter or harvest, whatever you want to call it. Those are the two areas where good things have happened. But unfortunately, they got some dairy stuff that really made cattle slaughter look bad. Uh, there hasn't been anything put up really terrible about pig slaughter. Um, you know, we've got to get, uh, you know, get it out to people, the things we're doing. I'm at the point right now that I don't want to put video cameras in place. Let's stream it out to the tour web page. Map of the U.S. comes up, and you can click on different plants you can look. You want to click on some pig farms or whatever? You can see what's going on inside. Because you have activist groups that would like people to believe that everybody hits pigs with gate rods. That's simply not true. That's like saying everybody drives drunk. That's not true. Ag has done a rotten job of communicating. And, it's, and I find that, you know, I thought it was very interesting in Hollywood. They were just curious. And I've talked to some people, they, you know, choose not to eat meat. You know what? My chemistry is such that if I don't have some animal protein in the morning and I support the pork industry, especially when I'm traveling, got to have some bacon. <laughs> and I find that if I don't support the, the, the animal industry in the morning, by 10 o'clock in the morning I'm lightheaded and I don't function. I'm O positive blood. And my chemistry has got to have animal protein. I've talked to other O blood types. I don't have any proof of that. But um, uh, there's other people I think can tolerate a vegan diet really well. But then you need to be thinking, well, are tearing up the fields in South America to make soybean monocultures, is that the greatest thing to do? You know, when you look at rangeland and some of the lands here in Nebraska, the only thing you can do with some of that land is raise ruminant animals on it. Ruminant animals have got a place in sustainable ag. I've been doing a lot of talks at grazing conferences, and I'm really interested to see how you're getting a new grassland program. I think that's excellent. I think there's a question up top. Okay. 
Yes, um, I have a question about as a handler, where, what kind of frame of mind should I be in when I enter into the pen or when I start working with a cattle? As I know that for myself, you know, a cow that doesn't go through the gate after, you know, hanging out for 20 now, minutes. Now this is in a feedlot pen you're talking about? Well, in a corral. So we'll say just working them through, um, you know, AIing or even moving them, you know, from one pasture to another and taking them through just barbed wire gate. Well, and one of the things that's really important on, on, on pasture rotation is you want to control the movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you get into the areas where they're moving all the time, people are weeding cattle. But you want to walk, you want to control the movement going through the gate. You know, some people want to hurt them, other people want to lead them. I don't really care which way you do it, but you want to control the movement. Because if the mama cows run through the gate and ditch new babies, that's not very good for the calves. And uh, so what you want to try to do is to get a certain outcome. And I'm finding when I go in the areas where they're doing some very intensive pasture rotation, a lot of those people are leading cattle now rather than driving them. And then when they come up to the gate, if they're mobbing the gate, they don't open the gate until the animals get back a little bit and stand, then they open the gate. No, you've got to have manners before we open the gate. <laughs> you know, the bottom line is, is a want calm movement. There's a lot of discussion about exactly how to do things. There's a lot of consultants out there. I'm going to go more on the outcome. I don't want to get a calm, walking movement. I think there's a question right okay. down front. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I had a question about, you, you mentioned a lot of interaction between the uh, cattle, cattle and man, cattle and the horse. And one of the questions that I had is, if we, we have interaction every day with a feed truck going through the feedlot, would it be um, in your best interest to maybe take that door off that feed truck and put a plexiglass on there so that the cattle can see the body language of the human moving through the feedlot every day? Well, the thing is, a guy in a truck, a guy is going to view that as a guy in a truck. You see, pigs will differentiate between a man in the alley and a man who actually walks through their pens. And there's nothing worse on loading day than the first time the pigs experience someone in their pens. And when you go to load them, they're screeching and going up the walls. No, you need to walk through them. They differentiate between a guy in a truck and a guy in a pen. It's not going to work. Uh, it, but what you, and of course, I know feed yards obviously going to be using horses with pen riding, and it's too much walking. But when you bring the cattle up to process them, uh, you know, vaccinate and stuff, well, have some experience with going in and out of gates with a man on foot. I don't want to have them come to the slaughter plant or the harvest facility, whatever you want to call it, and they meet the first man on foot there. There's been some people run over at the plants. Because you get in a small pen and they're bouncing back and forth, going back and forth, they can't get away from the mass. It's really scary. You see, but they're, since they're a visual thinker, they're very specific in how they view things. And even if I put a plexiglass door on a feed truck, he's still a guy in a truck. That's not the same as a guy walking around in the pen. And the thing with the pigs, you see, you've got a guy in the alley, he's right there next to the pigs. But he never went in the pen. I've seen cattle where the water trough cleaner comes up the center line of the pen, the cattle don't move. Walks into the middle of the pen, they might be scattering around. Animals need to get used to people walking through them. So when they go down the supply chain, let's say the cattle are leaving the ranch, they aren't bouncing off the walls at the auction when somebody's trying to move them on foot. You know, that ideally, you know, they ought to be trained to the horse, a four-wheeler, and on foot. And then I'm not a fan of dogs around the crowds. That teaches cattle to kick. And I have almost been killed twice for a very dangerous kicking where dogs have been biting cattle in a lead up shoot. They can't get away. Boy, they'll give you both barrels right in the head. Well, you want scary. How about both barrels in the head this close to your head? Been there twice. Once in Texas, once in Colorado. I'm going, whoa. And then, then the animal did take the hard hat off a guy, hit the rim of the hard hat, and flipped the hard hat up in the air. That was like bad news. Uh, question over here, and then back here, and we'll wrap up. Okay, and then I'll be out there at the book table. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line, Temple. Okay, <laughs> all right. Ronnie, I was going to give her a whole new list of things to talk about here. Sorry to 
we're running out of time, but the, have you noticed that Temple is hardly ever hard to get to say what she really wants to say? I have noticed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was, uh, ha we invited her into a meeting in Des Moines as, as a welfare chairman at the NPPC and dreading the darn meeting. Uh, as it turned out, Temple was a sweetheart. And I called you that, Temple. Have you ever been called that in public before? A sweetheart? Yes. Well, thank you for calling me a sweetheart. Well, you okay. betcha. Uh, on the other hand, uh, John McGlone that was there from Texas Tech was a knothead. But he continually uh, tried to demonstrate how animals could be raised, and that wasn't necessarily appropriate or good, but options that could work. And this is where our industry on the swine side is going now. We're trying to do things that can work. Well, we've got to do stuff that we can, that's yeah, going to work. I, we've I, got I, to do things, reasonable things that are going to work. Now, in Spain, uh, just there last year, uh, you know, they agreed to animal welfare issues and how to, handling of sows and so forth. Uh, and the far off date, but uh, all of a sudden that date came. And there's an awfully lot of the small producers that had no money to convert their facilities to, con to the group housing and they're going out of business. Well, I think that one of the things in the group housing, you've got to give a long lead time. One, let's take Smithfield back east. That stuff was 30 years old and rusted out. You know, I think we've got to give people time for equipment to wear out and, and, uh, you know, and then you replace it when it's rusted out. I mean, I, I would, I'd be the first, pro I'd totally defend at least 10 year lead time. Well, you know, let things, let stuff wear out. You know, the, the, the whole idea of welfare started in the north of London with two meat markets that wanted to outdo each other, so they started promoting the concept of welfare friendly animals. But uh, uh, anyway, we have a, a big PR problem ahead, and uh, well, I don't know how is, we're going to solve it. I, the thing is, you got people out in Hollywood asking what feedlots are. I went down to um, our, our sister school, University of Colorado, and I had an undergraduate down there that said to me, this is what she said to me, if meat is sold to Whole Foods, then the cattle are born on a ranch. If the meat goes from the regular supermarket, then the cattle are born in a feedlot. That was two years ago. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, they just don't know. Oh, and then you got people that you know, think eggs grow on trays or milk grows in the back of the grocery store. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's just ridiculous. And now let's look at where there's been some bright spots on PR. Fair Oaks Farm. Beautiful dairy outside of Illinois. They have bus tours come in there. They got the calving cam. They're building Pig Adventure. The people can come in and look through a glass enclosed uh, swine confinement building and, and uh, see how pigs are raised. We've got to get rid of the mystery sheds. But we've got to do a better job. I just looked at a new publication that came out from NPPC talking about We Care, and out of all the pictures they had, it showed the outsides of farms, and only one picture inside the farm was sow with some piglets. Why aren't they showing the insides of the barns? You know, we're going to have to show it. And if there's things where you're squirming, you know, and I know that castrating baby pigs isn't that wonderful, and uh, I hope the new Pfizer product's going to be successful. I've been a big proponent of that, because then maybe we won't have to castrate baby pigs. You know, I think we've got to look at everything we do and say, if I brought my wedding guests out here from New York or Chicago, what are they going to think? A well-run slaughter plant passes the test. I have personally taken people on a lot of tours. And one of the things I do is I have them watch the trucks unload, and they're amazed how quiet the cattle come off. And then I have them watch them go up the chute, and they go, wow, they just walk right up the chute. That's the way it should be. That's One what we got to do. Last question right here in the front. I mean, okay. We talked about how uh, handling, handlers at the processing plant, handlers at the feed yard, and, um, and you did talk a little about the ranchers. And now, feed yard handling's gotten a lot better, a lot better. Do you believe to sum up everything that it all needs to start with the ranchers when they are first calved and introducing the young um, calves with pins and, and handling equipment? Yes, Do you believe that's I think where, the that's ranchers where it... need to be doing that. Okay. In fact, most of the people that are doing you know, the low stress cattle handling workshops emphasize walking out amongst your cows, getting them calmed down, taking young heifers that you're going to keep, walking them through the chutes, feeding them in the crowds, getting them used to uh, going through the facility. So that, that first experience in that corral's not just, you know, getting smacked around in the squeeze chute. You know, you, yeah, we do have to put them in the squeeze chute. But just walking them through and getting them habituated. And there's quite a bit of research now that supports 
getting animals habituated to handling procedures. No, we need to be doing that. And, then, and, and ranch handling's gotten better. Cattle handling is the bright spot. And the thing that frustrates me is the public doesn't know about it. That's what frustrates me. I fixed the slaughter plants, the harvest facilities, whatever you want to call them, and the only ones, up, the main ones up on the internet, it's all the awful stuff, half dead dairy cows that shouldn't even be there. Well, that's why we did the Temple Grandin beef plant video, and we're now working on the Temple Grandin uh, pork plant video. Thank you. I have one last question I'm going to ask as the, okay. the moderator here, Temple. Uh, I mentioned that I've known, known Temple a long time and have admired her as a fellow animal scientist. There are a lot of, of stories around about Temple and about how she chose to put herself in the place of the animal to better understand what the animal was experiencing. I think you referred to that uh, tonight in one of your slides. Give us a couple examples of ways that you did that. What are some places where you tried to experience? Well, what the I did go to the cattle dip that one time, and I don't recommend that. That's one doing of the that. legends. Yeah. I don't recommend that. And um, but one thing I do recommend doing: watch when you're working a cattle. Where do they stop? What are they looking at? What are they pointing their ears and eyes towards? If they're calm, they'll point their ears and eyes right towards something they might be afraid of. They'll show you the things in the chute they don't like. And I find lots of times. You might have to track down four or five distractions. Like maybe you've got to fix the black hole effect. Then you've got to get rid of the gate that jiggles. Then you've got something that bumps them here and you've got to change that. You may have to fix four or five little small things and then things are going to work a whole lot better. Be very observant of small visual detail. Handle small groups, use following behavior, and get your mouth shut. No whistling, no screaming. It's really, really stressful. Okay, well I want to thank everybody for coming. One of the traditions that we started with the Hearman Lectures last year is to give each lecturer a medal to remember their time coming to the University of Nebraska that signifies the Hearman Lectures. Uh, it's a picture of a tree of life. And Temple, we'd like to present you with your Hearman oh, Lecturer well, medal. You. Okay. So you'll remember coming, right. coming with us. Right. And okay. we'll get a picture with the Hearmans with okay. that later. Right. Temple is going to be outside. Uh, for book signing and for you to have a chance to visit with her out in the lobby. There will be a reception out there on your way out. We'd ask you to join us. Please join us for the next Hearman Lecture, which is February the 12th, here in this same facility. It's at 3.30 in the afternoon on that Tuesday when Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamchuk, uh, wife, husband, wife, team, faculty members from the University of California at Davis, uh, will come to talk to us about genetics and the future of farming. So uh, please join us then, February 12th, 3.30. Thanks for being here tonight.